All right, Micah 1, verse 13. He says, O thou inhabitant of Laish, bind the chariot to the swift beast. She is the beginning of the sin of the daughter of Zion, for the transgressions of Israel were found in thee. Okay, so he's talking about they found where Israel transgressed originated in Laish. Hmm. Said we were, when we came in there, we discovered as we were tearing things up, you were the cause for that mess that Israel had corrupted itself with. The chariot has to be talking about the Assyrians attacking and they're using uh, fine steed Arabians to come in there and, um, you know, that was the, the manpower, the horsepower, I mean literal horsepower of the day. <laughs> um, in the... Uh, he says in Proverbs that safety is of the Lord. It doesn't matter how many chariots and atom bombs and all that mess you got. If you don't have God, you don't have safety. Now, all of that junk can go on and has for years and years. I think even in Germany, when we were bombing the smithereens out of them, you know there had to be some Christians over there that God was protecting and getting them out okay. Uh, you put your strength and your trust in God, not a government. Anywhere, anytime, doesn't matter how good or bad they are. God will have people in every place. Even in China right now, God's got some people over there too. He's protecting them. Your strength is not dependent on man. It's dependent on God. In Exodus 15, 19, the Bible says this. For the horse of, for the horse of Pharaoh went into... Uh, went in with his chariots and with his horsemen into the sea. They thought they had it made. They said, we'll catch up with these. They're just walking on foot. You know, you think about it. There's no reason Pharaoh couldn't overtake them. There are all these people with children and women and bringing their junk and doing it on foot. He's got the fine battle steeds up here and he's coming after them. And the Lord brought, against the, uh, brought again the waters of the sea upon them. But the children of Israel went on dry land in the midst of the sea. God doesn't need to invent a new weapon. He just used the sea. Just use some water. Um, the elements are not nature. The elements are a creation of God. God's creation, if he demands it, will give him service. And many times it does. Look at 1 Kings 22. First Kings 22 will be in verse 35. First Kings 22. says, And a certain man drew a bow at a venture, and smote the king of Israel between the joints of the harness. Wherefore he said unto the driver of his chariot, Turn thine hand, and carry me out of the host, for I am wounded. Now you know that arrow didn't just fly up into the air on its own and smite the king perfectly. No, God's behind all that. There's no, if you're a Christian, you don't believe in chance. You believe God overrules all. So, Faith and trust must be in him alone. Now, that's what Israel had fled from, both the north and the south. The north did it first, and Assyria is coming in and about to wipe them out to the last man. And the south is picking up the mantle that, they, that their uh, sister left behind. Look at it in 2 Kings 9. Second Kings 9, verse 23. And, Jor and Joram turned his hand and fled and said to Ahaz, There is treachery, O Ahaz. And Jehu drew a bow with his full strength and smote Joram between his arms. And the arrow went out his heart and uh, he sunk down in his chariot. You know, God will use wicked men to do his work. He doesn't have to always pick a righteous man to do his job. He's going to use Assyria and he's going to use Babylon. 
Doesn't mean that he's saying they're great people. <laughs> it's, they're just a convenient weapon. And most governments, you can see God's hand in, not because the people are righteous that are ruling it, but because God uses them. He'll override a wicked man to do some righteous things and vice versa. The inhabitants of Laish is the beginning of sin according to our verse. Um, the daughter of Zion, he's talking about in thee. So that's the south, the daughter of Zion. Micah 1, look at verse 14. Verse 14, I'm going to need to look at a pronunciation for this thing. How you say it? I said Moreshet Gap. Moresh. Moreshet Gap. Yeah. Moreshet Gap. That's phonetically. All right. Just say that guy and get it over. That there. one. Uh, the guy in here. Moresh. Gath. Moresh of Gath. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> Wherefore shalt thou give presents to Moresh of Gath, the horses of the, uh, the houses of Akzeb? 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 <laughs> Where is where's Kelly when I need her? <laughs> Shall be a lie to the king of Israel. That is, you're going to places to bind, uh, to, to get help and put, a, put, a, put a, a contract between you and a heathen as though you can depend on that. That's exactly what the devil does. The devil tells a man, hey, I'll make you this deal and I'll do this for you and I'll give you wealth and fame. Well, it loses all of its joy once you start having to serve him. It's no good. He's no, he's no helper to anybody. Laish, that's on the, the border there with the Philistines. Um, he says they're going to give presents. So they give it to them in order to get help. All they, they, They're going to have a league of nations. Okay, join with us. Come protect us. You know, we'll pay you this and we'll pay you that. And what normally happens in these situations is they'll make the payment. But then nobody will protect them. And we saw it happen with Israel. It's going to happen here in the siege. Now, this is, a, this is a heathen that's doing it. And the heathens are doing the same thing Israel did. Trying to pay off a foreigner that God's already said, I'm going to use to destroy you with. Well, you can pay the devil all you want. He's still not going to protect you. Um, look at Micah 1 verse 15. Micah 1 verse 15. Yet will I bring an heir unto thee, O inhabitant of Moresha. He shall come to Adullam, the glory of Israel. You know, that's where David ran to hide, the cave of Adullam. That's, uh, that's over there around uh, Jerusalem. And he says, God says, I'm, I'm wiping the whole thing out. Both heathen and Israel north and Judah south. This is a heavy message. Now I think about these things. We've got to be careful. <laughs> Look back at verse 1. Chapter 1, verse 1. The only way he can give this fire and brimstone message he's given is this, verse 1, the word of the Lord that came. Unless God tells you to say it, don't be just mean because you want to be mean. And don't just be lamb blasted. You know, that's Job's comforter. <laughs> mm -hmm. They thought they had some good human reasoning and spiritual, you know, coding on it for what they were telling Job. But God didn't tell them to say that. So even in your... The flesh can get involved in a message <laughs> real easy. And don't let the flesh start talking. We want God to talk. Now, this is a prophecy from God, so it's not a human. He's not just having a bad day and he's taking it out on everybody. Because <laughs> that can happen. Look at Hosea 10. 
this transgression of Israel. Hosea 10 verse 9. O Israel, thou hast sinned from the days of Gibeah. There they stood. The battle in Gibeah against the children of iniquity did not overtake them. This is the Philistines. That's where Saul gets his in Gibeah. Look at 1 Kings 12. First Kings 12, verse 26. Here's the iniquity. Here's the north's problem. God makes it very plain all the way through that Old Testament. He'll tell you, this is why I hate the north. Hey, that's not a bad thing to say now. Um, <laughs> he says, First Kings 12, verse 26. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. Now, notice where this happens. He says, he said this not to the people. He said it in his heart. That's where sin begins, in the heart. Now, I know we think of the heart as this muscle that's pumping blood, but there's mo it's more than that. It's the inside of you. That's where you do your contemplating. That's where your plotting and planning comes in, is in your heart, who you are, the center of who you are. Verse 27. I pointed that out because it's going to come back up in chapter 2, verse 27. If this people go up to sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of this people turn again unto the Lord. Wouldn't that be a good thing? Just because they were in the south was no reason that he should forsake the Lord. That's why he was king, was because God was punishing Solomon by taking ten kingdoms from him. So why does he now reward the, the Lord for doing him good by turning his back on him? Mm, that's what both the north and the south end up doing. Verse 28, Whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold. Okay, that's that idol worship. All the way through, God is against idols. In the tribulation, an idol is going to be set up, an image. And they're going to worship it. All the way through the Bible, it's preaching against idolatry. Even in the church age. Now I know because we live in America, we want to spiritualize that. And you can. Uh, help yourself. However, it means what it says. Idols. So if you go to India, it means idols. And you preach against idols. Uh, look at 2 Samuel 5. Second Samuel 5, verse 7. Okay, so we've seen the, the sin for the north was this idolatry worship. It seems like the sin for the south begins when David captures Zion. Second Samuel 5, verse 7. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, the same as the city of David. Okay, that's going to be Jerusalem. And something's going on there that's a... Uh, a holdover from this Philistine layish worship that infects them. Uh, the Philistines attack immediately in, in verse 18, and uh, the Philistines are teaching um, something that was the wickedness that corrupted Judah. And you notice it didn't just come out all of a sudden, because in David's day, we didn't see it. It wasn't predominant. That's how sin creeps in. One little spot here, and nobody's going to notice it. Matter of fact, you still be able to go to church and do all your Bible reading and Bible study and come up with some great messages and some notes and sermons. However, that sin is building. Sin never stays stagnant. Well, neither does righteousness. So decide what you want. Uh, look at Micah 1, verse 16. Micah 1, 16. He says, Make thee bald, and poll thee for thy delicate uh, children. Enlarge thy baldness as the eagle, for they are gone into cap captivity from thee. Thy baldness like an eagle. I hate to tell everybody this, but an eagle's a bad bird. Mm -hmm. I, I know that it's our, our national bird or whatever. It's the same one for Germany. It, it's the same one for... A lot of yeah. Many, many. 
Um, the eagle is an unclean animal and he's a vulture. He kills stuff. He takes prey. and He's not a good guy. <laughs> he flies high, but he's a bad dude. He's unclean. He says, make bald like an eagle. Now, I don't know for sure. I'm just going to speculate here a little bit. We had a macaw. And these birds have a tendency to pluck. They pluck themselves for no reason. And it becomes a habit. And you can't break them of it. Um, it's like the kids nowadays. We talked about it a little bit. The kids nowadays all have to have tattoos. Why? They get addicted to pain. Something satanic in that. And he says, make you bald just like an eagle. Go ahead and pluck yourself. Enjoy the pain. Wait till I bring mine. Look at 1 Samuel 22. The cave of Adullam was supposed to be a great place. Remember, that's where David used as a stronghold and he could hide out there. Here's the Bible is going to tell us about it. 1 Samuel 22, verse 1. Therefore departed thence, and uh, David therefore departed thence, and escaped to the cave of Adullam, <clears throat> the cave of Adullam. And when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down thither to meet him, <clears throat> to him. <clears throat> so what happens here is it's a cave system. It's all these caverns and interconnecting, and you've got to know the system or you'll be lost. And you go down there, and it seems like a great hideout if you're familiar with the caverns and the system. But God says the day's coming. He's obviously giving wisdom to the Assyrians and the Babylonians to navigate the caves. That's not going to be a safe spot anymore. Hmm. What well, doesn't seem, you know, that you want to do fighting on the enemy's territory, not on yours. Because what happens when you fight on your home turf is it gets tore up. Mm -hmm. But there is a home field advantage. You know the hiding spot. You know the places you can slip away and they don't know where they are and you know what roads connect and which ones are dead end. However, God's giving some special wisdom to these men, the Assyrians and the Babylonians, to come in and destroy and leave no hiding spot for anybody. That's of God. That's not human. Uh, that's not normal. Look at Ezra 9. Ezra 9, verse 3. Here's these eagles making themselves bald. Ezra 9, verse 3. And when I heard this thing, I rent my garment, my mantle, plucked off, my, off the hair of my head. Oof, that's got to be painful. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how a person does that. I couldn't couldn't make myself do that uh, the hair of my head and my beard and sat down astonished uh, I think I would uh, I would be uh, I would have to be very grieved to be moved to pull my hair out mm -hmm. uh, it needs to be cut but I don't think I'm gonna pull it <laughs> but that's what they did he says um, they were doing this to such a degree and it was a sign of mourning that when your relatives died, what the pagans would do was pull their hair. He says, make no baldness for the dead. Mm -hmm. So as a sign of mourning and weeping, they would rip out their own hair. Oh. There's something about that pain thing. I don't like anything to do with pain. Mm -hmm. Now, fortunately, God's given me a high pain tolerance. So I can deal with a lot of things, you know, that have, but I don't choose any of it. <laughs> Job 1. Job 1, verse 20. Here's how a righteous man would do it. Job was a righteous man. He's going to show shame. 
you know, it'd be a shame for a man to shave his head and, and beard um, in these days, the ancient times. Job 1 verse 20, Then Job arose and ran his mantle and shaved his head and fell upon uh, the ground and worshipped. Okay, he's showing obese, but see, he's not inflicting self-pain there. He shaved it. <laughs> he didn't rip it out. Okay, there, uh, there's something satanic, I think, behind this inflicting self-pain. And it's wicked. And we're going to see more and more of it. There's a, the, the kids go through the fad of cutting themselves. Mm -hmm. That cutting is addictive because it doesn't make sense. It wouldn't be addictive if you were a normal person. But there's something satanic in it. Micah chapter 2, Micah 2 verse 1. We saw that earlier, the way those golden calves showed up in the north, the kingdom, was this. He said in his heart, I'll bet you if I don't have, you know, an appealing worship service, those boys are going to run back to Israel. They're going to go to Jerusalem where they're supposed to be, and I'll lose my kingdom. Micah 2 verse 1, Woe to them that devise iniquity. He's thinking it up. And work evil upon their beds. Notice they're working evil. But they're laying down. What evil are they working? They're working out a plan. They're putting all the pieces together. He says, when the morning is light, they practice it. Because it is in the power of their hand. Now, they've convinced themselves overnight a lot of things happen at night. At night, now for good or bad, a lot of times I'll be laying in bed and, and uh, trying to get some sleep. <laughs> and all of a sudden I'll remember the three verses that were supposed to be in that lesson that I was putting together. <laughs> and you got to get up and go do it. Mm -hmm. uh, here they're practicing what they've been cultivating all night. All night they've been plotting and planning and com coming up with something great they think. And now they've convinced themselves they can. The can-do generation. They get up in the morning. They do it. Why? Because it's in the power of their hand. Well, I can do it. Let me do it. Now, we get in trouble when we start doing things. <laughs> we need to ask God what we're supposed to be doing. And just do that. Because then we don't have to. He'll do it through us. Nahum 1. Nahum 1 verse 11. Nahum 1.11 There is one come out of thee that imagineth evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. Wow. You know what happens? Your mind will run away with you. <laughs> it will. And what will happen is it will start imagining some evil things. Now, I mean, we're, we're a good crowd in here. We're not going to go out and imagine the same evil that the world does. But our evil will be it's in the power of my hand to fix this problem or that problem. That's evil from God's point of view. He wants to do it. And he says, you know what that does? It corrupts your counsel. Notice this person who's devising, a, how did he put it? Imagining evil against the Lord is also a wicked counselor. It corrupts your communication. Imagine that. You don't even have to have wicked friends to corrupt your communication. Your mind can do it for you. <laughs> We're a weak people. Acts chapter 23. Acts 23 verse 12. Our problem is when we put our mind to something, we'll find a way to do it. <laughs> he said they do this because it's in the power of their hand to do it. But when we determine that it's in our power to do it, we will do it. Acts 23, 12. This is, some guys have decided they're going to put a hit out on Paul. And when it was day, certain of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under a curse, saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. Now, either they lied or they died. 
because Paul didn't die. <laughs> but that's what happens. When you start trusting in the power of your might to accomplish what you determine, you curse yourself. Ooh. Romans chapter 1. Romans 1 verse 30. Romans 1 verse 30. This is a list of bad things. <laughs> Backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters. Now look at this one. Inventors of evil things. You know how they invent evil things? They laid in bed one night and drum it up, dreamt it up, dreamed it up. How do you say that word? <laughs> they were contemplating. The wheels in their head were turning and they were imagining how they could make something happen. We live in a world of devices. We were talking to Kelly today, talking about an EMP. If there was an electromagnetic pulse sent off over America, it would, it would kill the nation. We depend on every little device. You can't walk in somewhere without punching a screen somehow. You can't pay for gas without looking at a screen. <laughs> they got a TV blaring at you while you're trying to pump your gas. <laughs> it's crazy. The billboards now, now they're digital. Mm -hmm. You got to watch three new ads every second as you drive down the road. <laughs> yeah. We might need an EMP. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs 3 verse 27. Now the hard part for us to do is to determine what our hand is allowed to do. God's given our hand a little bit of power, but that power is only to be used for what he decides is good for it to do. Proverbs 3, 27, withhold not good from them to whom it is due, when it is in the power of thine hand to do it. Hmm. I don't see anybody sitting, not many, Laying awake at night thinking, who can I do good to? Who can I be a blessing to? But that's where our mind ought to go. When the mind slips into this, I'll cook up a way to fix this and I'll get on top and I'll do... That's what these people were doing. They were imagining evil. It ought to be. I wonder what, my hand, what, was, what would be in the power of my hand to do someone good. That's where our mind ought to be. Look at uh, Genesis um, 31. Laban. Laban's going to demonstrate something to us. Just because you have the ability to do something doesn't mean you should. And even a wicked person should be able to recognize when God is saying, sit on your hands. <laughs> Genesis 31 verse 29. Laban says, it is in the power of my hand to do you hurt. But the God of your father spake unto me yesternight, saying, Take thou heed that thou speak not to Jacob, either good or bad. But if I could have my way, I would do more than just speak, buddy. <laughs> but he was smart enough to know he might cook up some plans, but he sure had better not practice it. Because God showed up and said, You do it, you're a dead man. Proverbs 17. Proverbs 17, verse 16, one of my favorite verses. I haven't said that in a while, so I just thought I'd say it. <laughs> it is. <laughs> Proverbs 17, 16. He says, Wherefore is there a price in the hand of a fool to get wisdom, seeing he hath no heart to it? You know what happens with man? He says, It's in the power of my hand to do this or do that. And then he has to go practice it. He doesn't really know if it really is in the power of his hand. He's got to go find out. He's imagining it is. I'm sure it'll work out. You know, I, I think I can. Well, then you go do it and you find out. We've all thought we could do something and found out we couldn't. <laughs> okay, now you've got wisdom. He says, why does a fool think he has power in his hand? And he goes to do something, then he gets wisdom. And the wisdom didn't start in his heart. It started from experience. Some people only learn that way. You get Job 12. Job 12 verse 10. Job 12 verse 10. 
we think our power means something. It means zero. All God has to do is blink and we have no power. Job 12, verse 10. Speaking of God. In whose hand is the soul of every living thing. Now there's a hand that has some power. God's. He says, as a matter of fact, every living soul is right within my grasp. I can squish it if I feel like it. And the breath of all mankind. I don't see anybody worried about whether or not we're going to be able to breathe tomorrow. But he says, you might ought to think about it. God's the one holding breath. If God doesn't release it, man, don't get it. Look down at verse 13. With him is wisdom and strength and uh, it says, and, uh, and strength. He hath counsel and understanding. Man tries to counsel himself. The great thing that's, not great, the big thing that's going on right now is every kid has to go see a counselor, a psychologist, a psychiatrist, a psy something. <laughs> yeah, sci fi. What's going to happen is they're going to get bad counsel. If, there's, if the child or the person going to the counselor is a Christian and they've not asked God about it. Now, I'm not saying God won't tell you to go seek counsel sometime. But he may. But it'll be few and far between because he's the mighty counselor. That's his name. Uh, Daniel chapter 5. Daniel 5 verse 23. Another one of my favorite verses. <laughs> This is Belshazzar being told off. Daniel has interpreted the writing on the wall and he's going to let this guy have it and say, you knew better. Don't play ignorant. <laughs> Don't play innocent now. He says, Daniel 5, 23. But hast lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven and they have brought the vessels of his house before thee and uh, the and uh, before thee and thou and thy lords and thy wives and thy concubines, man, he's got wives and concubines and he he got the whole nation going on here. Have drunk wine in them. Talk about rubbing God's face in something. Yeah, we're just going to put some some hooch in this thing that's supposed to be dedicated to the Lord. Whew. that'll make him mad. And thou hast praised the gods of silver and of gold, of brass, iron, wood, and stone, which see not, nor hear, nor know. And the God, here's the punchline, and the God in whose hand thy breath is, and whose are all thy ways, hast thou not glorified. See, you didn't think about it, buddy, but you're still breathing, aren't you? You owe God glory for that. It's a good practice to get into every now and then just to thank God for the ability to breathe. Yeah. <laughs> now, I, I, don't, I don't really think about it. I don't have a problem breathing. Some people do. If you had emphysema or sleep apnea or yeah. asthma, some of those things, then you would get a better appreciation for me get, being able to breathe well. We've battled with this um, COVID thing a few times. One of the things it does is it attacks your air. Your oxygen goes down. Mm -hmm. This is all that stuff. God is able to give you breath and we got to thank him for it. Um, that's one of those minor things. We think it's minor and we just expect it to be there, but no, it's not. And if we get in a habit of ignoring the basics, I mean, we get down to it, that's a basic. If you can't breathe, you won't be here long. <laughs> Look at Micah 2. Micah 2, verse 2. Micah's going to start getting pointed with his message now. He's going against the rulers, the bigwigs, the rich boys. He says, they covet fields and take them by violence. You know how they did that coveting? They were dreaming it up. That's what we saw in the previous verse. They were laying in their bed one night and they thought, you know, I really could extend my property line. I just got that one guy sitting in the way. 
That's no problem. He ain't nobody. I'll just take him out. And they do it, he says, by violence and houses and take them away. So they possess a man and his house, even a man and his heritage. Now, this is a big no-no in Israel. In Israel, every seven years, the property returns to the household that it belonged to. Um, and that was Ahab's big downfall, you know, with Nabal. Exodus 20, 17 tells us the property rule. Exodus 20, 17. Commandment. Very, very basic and obvious. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. <laughs> Build your own. <laughs> Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. All of Israel knew that rule. They may have been a little foggy on some of the rules in Leviticus. But you can count on it. They knew that one. 1 Kings 21. 1 Kings 21 verse 2. First Kings 21 verse 2. And Ahab spake unto Nabal saying, Give me thy vineyard that I may have it for a garden of herbs because it is near to my house. You know, it'd be real good for me to extend my property line over here. You know, you're kind of in my way. <laughs> That's basically what he's saying. And I'll give thee for it a better vineyard uh, than it. Or if it seemed good to thee, I will give thee the worth of it in money. And Nabal said to Ahab, The Lord forbid it me that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. He says, It's illegal. You're the king. You ought to know that. Now, he was nice about it. I'm being mean about it. Yeah. <laughs> but that's the gist of it. The gist of it is this. It's an inheritance. You know, I can't, not, I can't, if I, if I wanted to, I can't do it. It goes against the law. Verse 16. And it came to pass when Ahab heard that Nabal was dead, that Ahab arose up uh, to go down to uh, the vineyard of Nabal of Jezreel to take possession of it. He said, good, he's gone. I'm claiming it. Now, I, I don't even think that's right. They should have had a search done. Are there any relatives? Who's the next of kin? Where does this property belong? That's the way it would be done. He says, no, I'm going to take charge. He's gone, it's mine. I can have anything I want. I'm the king. <laughs> Look at verse 19. And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hast thou killed? Did he do any killing? Ahab killed nobody. And also taken possession. He hadn't taken possession yet. He went down there to go take possession. But in his mind he had. And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, In the place where the dogs lick the blood of Nabal, Shall the dogs lick thy blood, even thine? It starts with a thought. The brain's got to be controlled. Matthew chapter 21. Matthew 21 verse 13. Israel has become just as wicked as modern times now. will make, make religion into a business. Matthew 21, 13. Jesus speaking. And said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer. But you've made it a den of thieves. You know what prayer is? Prayer is using your mind correctly. There's been a bunch of religious rulers thinking up some things on their bed. You know, those people have got to have, they've got to have lambs how about this? We set up a, a, a lamb auction when you come into the temple. Don't worry about bringing you a lamb. Just come on in here. We'll sell you one. And we'll make good money on that. We can go up every year and claim it's inflation. And that's what they were doing. He says, no, you're supposed to be using your mind for good. But you weren't. And then it wasn't just contemplating wickedness. They carried it out. What was supposed to be a place for your mind to think on something heavenly... A house of prayer had become a den of thieves. Now, he's quoting something. 
He's quoting Isaiah 56. Isaiah 56, verse 6. He's quoting a time in the millennium. This is all millennial reference. Isaiah 56, verse 6. Also the sons of the strangers that join themselves unto the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord. These are heathens. He said there's coming a day that the strangers are going to love God. To be his servants. Everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and taketh hold of my covenant. Verse 7, his quote. Even then will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. That's the millennial setup. They're going to all, all nations are going to flow into Jerusalem and the, the, he's going to set up a, a real tabernacle where he dwells. He says, uh, my, the house of prayer, their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar for mine house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. Now that's millennial reference. God says we can't even get to the millennium part because we got a bunch of uh, a den of thieves in here now. That thieving started in the brain. And then it was, they thought, in the power of their hand to produce it. And they did produce it. But God put it to a screeching halt. Just like he's doing in both the north and the south. Both Samaria and Jerusalem are going to fall. And it's because the heart had gotten away from him. Amos chapter 8. Amos 8 verse 4. It was too easy to get rich. And too hard to get rich. <laughs> the rich people could get richer and the poor people could never get ahead. It's just like America. Just like every nation. The wealthy seem like they always just get more and more wealthy and the poor just struggle and struggle harder and harder. That's always been the same way until there's coming a day that righteousness rules. When righteousness rules, he'll flip the table. Amos 8 verse 4. Hear this, O ye that swallow up the needy, even to make the poor of the land to fail. Hmm. He says the land needs some poor people. Imagine that. You know, in the millennium, you read the book of James, it's the poor man that's the good guy. The rich man is the dirty dog. You find the same thing in Psalms. In the tribulation, that's going to be so. Because the poor man won't take the mark. Because, you know, he doesn't want to lose his salvation. Or he wants to get into the kingdom. And he won't be able to buy or sell. He's going to have to beg, borrow, and steal. Verse 5. Saying, when will the new moon be gone? You know, the new moon, that was a high holy day that we may sell corn. So I wish this religious stuff would get over with so I can get back to business. And the Sabbath, that we may set forth wheat. I wish this Sunday would get over with. Now it wasn't Sunday, it was Sabbath. I wish this religious service would be ended. I got some big plans for, you know, I just realized there's a great way for me to make money. And that's what they're doing. But it's not just making money, they're stealing. They're, they're doing it illegally. Uh, set forth wheat making the ephah small and the shekel great and falsifying the balances by deceit. So he says, you know the thing that every kid I guess learns the hard way is they say, hey, hey little brother, you got some, some change over there. Let me trade you out some of these big coins for your little ones. See that penny? See how much bigger that is from the dime? <laughs> that's making one bigger and the other one smaller although the value is not the same mm. that's wickedness devising it thinking it up an evil intellect uh, I think we're just all given to that evil intellect and the devil will be glad to help you out with it that's what's going on in the nation we better stop it there I'll pick up at, at Micah 2-3 next week uh, but what's going to happen here is he's going after the big wigs. Now talk about taking your life into your hands. That's exactly what he's doing. You don't walk in and tell off the king. Now we're not talking about a democracy where you've got representatives and think, no, if the king decided it was off with your head, nobody would bat an eye. Now, 
He said the word of the Lord came to him. Now that's, that's a lot better to have the word of the Lord than the protection of bureaucracy. And I'm afraid most Christians have put their trust in bureaucracy, bure, that word, <laughs> in government rather than God. And when that happens, you soon find out, and America's about to, that the government don't help you, it hurts you. And you need God. But even in those cases, we'll find this book's going to have some very positive high points. If we ever get to it. <laughs> I'll point them out when we get there. All right, we'll pick up there next week. Micah 2, verse 3.